So the Arab world is pretty complex. You have the Middle East, the Gulf, the Arab speaking, but not completely considered Arab regions. And finally, the Maghreb or North Africa. Within each of these communities, you find hints and links to what shaped their identity over millennia. And Tunisia is a very complicated one. At some point, all of these empires and kingdoms left their mark on Tunisia. Wait, I see Vandals on that list. They're from Scandinavia, so like proto-Vikings? Eh, nah, they were Germanic, not Norse, so I wouldn't say that. Wow, Vikings in Africa. No, I mean, well, I mean, technically, yes, the Vikings in the 11th century were taking over, but we're talking about 5th century Vandals. They're not the same thing. Wait, you mean the uh, Punic Wars? What? No, that was centuries earlier between Rome and Carthage. So you're saying that Lebanese people fought Rome? What? No, well, I mean, unless you're referring to both having Phoenician roots, but why do they have hammams? Are they Turkish? And why are they speaking French? And aren't they Muslim and they're drinking wine? Is that allowed? Tunisia, everybody. Let's start the episode. It's time to learn geography. Now! Hey everybody, I'm your host, Barbs. Get your Geography Now merch at geographynow.com. It's not selling out if it's your brand. Oh, and what is this cool Tunisia flag shirt that I'm wearing with the logo? It's from unityshirtshop.com. Ruba from the Sudan episode makes these shirts, and if you would like one, go to the website and support her business. Thank you, Ruba. So I'm personally kind of excited for this one. A while back, I did a DNA test and I made a video on it. I found out I have North African roots. Well, you literally can't get more North African than Tunisia. And if so, so these guys could be my incredibly long distant cousins. First of all, say hi to Sammy. Okay, he's gonna be co-hosting with me. How hi you doing? guys, hi guys. How you doing? And uh, we also got Ahmed right here. How you doing? Good, how are you? He's gonna be uh, doing some of the segments in the episode. Yeah, right? stay tuned for that. It's gonna be great. Anything you guys wanna say quickly about Tunisia before we start? Tahiyatunas. Long live Tunisia. I hope you guys like the episode. I hope we make you proud. Well, now that we have our two Tunisians, let's use our two knees to jump in now, shall we? Oh, you just made a bad does that mean I get to punch you? Go ahead. So a quick side note, you guys, the entire continent of Africa actually gets its name from what Tunisia used to be called in Roman times. Africa. History here goes way beyond Roman times though. See, when it comes to history, Europeans are like, you have a 200 year old building and you think that's history? My bakery is older than that. But when Tunisians meet Europeans, it's like... Oh, you have a Roman ruin? <laughs> Try Carthaginian or Phoenician. Lots of landmarks in history here. Let's go to the map first, shall, shall we? we? <laughs> first of all, Tunisia is located in North Africa or the Maghreb region, which includes all the nations of Africa that straddle the Mediterranean. In fact, Tunisia is the northernmost point of the entire African continent. Cape Angela or Ras Ben Saka, which is this entire jagged cliffy area right here. Now here's the interesting thing. The monument for the northernmost point is on this small westernmost peninsula. However, if you geolocate the coordinates, the unnamed middle peninsula just to the east of it is actually just a few meters further north. So I'm not trying to piss off any Tunisian cartographers, but I'm just saying. In any case, Tunisia also has the northernmost island point in Africa as well. The Galit Islands or Ile de Chien or Dog Islands, about 12 miles or 19 kilometers further north in the Mediterranean. Speaking of islands, Tunisia has quite a few off their coasts, including the largest island in all of North Africa. Jerba, which is connected to the mainland by this cool 4 mile or 6.5 kilometer causeway bridge. The country is made up of 24 governorates, each one named after their capital city, whereas the capital of the country and largest city is the aptly named Tunis, which also holds the largest and busiest airport, Tunis Carthage International. It also holds the biggest and busiest shipping port of the country, the port of Tunis, and is famous for its elongated gullet, or gullet, which creates Lake Tunis with Fort Santiago of Chicli, an ancient Roman citadel site that is only accessible by this incredibly long and narrow jetty, but unfortunately closed off to the public. The crazy thing is, just north of this point is the Punic port of Carthage, where the ancient ships would dock and is now repurposed as a landmark and museum site. From there, the second and third largest cities are Sfax, just a bit further south, and Sus, in between Sfax and Tunis. Interestingly though, the second and third busiest airports are actually Enfida Hamame International, close to Sus, and due to the high tourism demand, Jerba Zarzis International ranks in number three. Getting around is mostly easy for the top half of the country. They have rail lines that extend all the way inland to Tozur and along the coast to Gab. From there, the road network becomes more sparse the further south you go until there is only one road, the partially unpaved C211, that goes all the way down to the tri point with Algeria and Libya. Okay, let's back up a few thousand years, shall we? Remember the Tonga episode we did two episodes ago? We talked about thalassocracies or maritime empires. Well, Tunisia was essentially the hub of one of the oldest renowned thalassocracies in the world, the Carthaginian Empire. It was a North African empire ruled by Punic people, but what are Punic people? They were Semitic of Phoenician origin, meaning that they came from the Levant, and they colonized the coast of North Africa. So does that mean Tunisian people are Phoenicians? Eh, not quite, because later Carthage fell to them. Then 
are they Latin? Not quite, because then everything fell to Vandals, Ottomans, Arabs, and the French. So what are they? We'll explain later in the episode, but long story short, it's like Arab, but eh. Arab. The coolest thing is that in Tunisia you can see bits and pieces of all these historical eras meshed into their civil environment, including the mosque of Qairawan. It is the oldest Muslim and Arab base in the Maghreb and it was the oldest mosque in the Maghreb as well. Some say it's like the fourth holiest site in Islam, but uh... <sighs> But uh, yeah, it's a complete casserole of influences. And with that, to explain a little bit more on the top notable sites of Tunisia, here's Ahmed to explain. Ahmed, come on in. First, the Medina of Tunis, which is basically the old part of the city. There are over 700 monuments and buildings that date back to the 12th century. It has Zituna, which is a mosque and a university, supposedly the oldest in the world. Nope, mine is the oldest. Yeah, Morocco, maybe it was registered first, but ours was around before. Plus, it was founded by a Tunisian woman, uh, and it's literally called University of Karawiyin, which means people of Kairawen. So, I mean... Oh! <laughs> we also have the Bardo Museum, Gbilli Oasis, Derba Synagogue. We also have ancient sites and ruins of Duga and Carthage. In Zarwan, we have Water Temple and Hanaya. Fun fact, after the destruction of Carthage, Romans tried to put salt on the land so nothing would grow, but now we make the best olive oil in the world. <laughs> <laughs> There's also underground homes in Matmata, which by the way, Matmata was the site of Tatooine in Star Wars, and it's a tourist spot, so go check it out. And finally, El Jam, the largest ancient Colosseum in Africa and also a UNESCO heritage site. And that's it for the famous sites. I'll see you guys later. Woo, thank you, Ahmed. Yeah, fun fact, the entire planet of Tatooine was named after Tatooine, Tunisia. But don't be fooled by Star Wars. Not all of Tunisia is a desolate desert deathscape. They have quite a bit of greenery too. Let's discuss that in... So you probably already know the deal. To summarize, most of North Africa kind of goes like this. And Tunisia is no exception. There's actually a saying, Tunis al Khadra, which means Tunisia the green. We're getting ahead of ourselves. First, let's jump into the motion graphic. For one, Tunisia lies right on the convergence of the African and Eurasian plates. Within this plate system, they are wedged between the Maghrebid Front Fault Line and the South Atlas Front Fault. These are the fault lines that essentially create the entire Atlas mountain chain stretching from Morocco to Tunisia's Cape Bon Peninsula. In this mountain chain, you can also find the tallest peak, Jebel Shambi. From there in the south, you get the Great Eastern Erg, a land of sand dunes containing the Jabil National Park shielded by the Kassar Mountains. Essentially, like we've discussed many times before, this mountainous region juxtaposed to the humid Mediterranean acts as like a shield that captures all the moisture and in return creates a rain shadow effect that causes everything past the mountains to become dry and arid, hence the Sahara. This is why the northern part of Tunisia is noticeably greener with forested hills and mountains that can even foster snow caps in the winter, which means yes, Tunisia does have ski resorts. In the south, everything becomes rocky and dry and temperatures obviously rise. From the mountains, most of the rivers flow, mostly in the north, including the longest one, the Majorda River, which empties into the Mediterranean. In regards to the largest inland body of water, though, it depends on what your classification stands on. If you're talking about the largest permanent lake that is not a lagoon connected to the ocean, many might claim Lake Ishkul or Ashkelon fits the bill, which is also a UNESCO heritage site. However, if you're talking about endorheic lakes, that is, seasonal lakes that dry up in the dry season, then of course we have to go to Shot el Jared, which means Palmland Lagoon. This massive salt pan is the largest one in the Sahara and fills up enough to ride boats in the winter months when the water tributaries empty into it. When it dries back up, a thick salt crust covers the ground, so much to the point where you can walk and even drive on it sometimes. Uh, yeah, shot al Jared. Gotta love those disappearing endorheic salt lakes. It's one of nature's coolest magic tricks. Now you see it, now it's gone. In any case, as you can see, there is a wide range of landscapes within Tunisia. However, they do put a huge emphasis on maritime culture. Despite being a relatively dry nation, water is kind of like a theme in their identity. And speaking of water, you need water for a triple shot of espresso break. And you know what that means, Noah comes in to fill in for the rest of this segment. Take it away, Noah. <laughs> Let's roll. You need like a fan or something. Now, fiscally speaking, Tunisia had kind of a roller coaster situation going on in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. For one, they aren't too much of a resource dependent state. Sure, at one point they were called the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. And sure, about 20% of their land is arable. They usually rank amongst the top 10 olive and date producers in the world. And sure, they have a small hydrocarbon industry with some natural gas deposits, as well as crude oil wells inland and offshore. But other than that, Tunisia has needed more to move forward in other directions. Eventually, 
Eventually, they privatized about 160 state-owned enterprises and entered an association agreement with the EU. Things were looking good, but then after the Arab Spring, extremist groups took advantage of the political situation and incited terror attacks, most notably at the Bardo Museum and Seuss Beach in 2015. This horrible event took a heavy blow to their tourism sector, the third largest in their economy. Nonetheless, Tunisia recovered as best they could. How so? By switching up primarily to the services sector. And how did they drive this sector? By putting a large portion of funds into education. At one point back in 2001, nearly one-fifth of their entire national budget was spent on education. They were the first country in the Arab world to use internet in 1992. And today, they often rank in the top for medical and software engineering fields in all of Africa. Tunisia is usually considered the premier health tourism destination in all of North Africa, and some claim, Ah, no, no, I know you're gonna say the whole Arab world. That's my title. Stay in your lane, okay? For what it's worth, though, of course tourism is their largest service industry. They have everything from beaches to ski resorts to Star Wars film sets. Get your lightsabers ready. One more thing they capitalize off of, their national parks with wildlife. And to talk more on that, here's Gary Harlow. <laughs> Let me crock your dial. So like most countries in North Africa, Tunisia has two separate types of flora and fauna. The green rocky mountain types and the dry arid terrain types. The country has 17 national parks for wildlife conservation, the most famous one probably being Lake Ishkul or Ashkelon, a UNESCO heritage site famous for being a migratory bird hotspot. Every conceivable species of duck, goose and waterfowl can be found here, including flamingos, oyster catchers, ruffs and smew. You heard me, there's a bird called a smew. And that's how it sounds too, it just kind of smews at you, smew. Disapproving of you just like your great aunt. Smew. <laughs> and just look at El Thaja National Park. Super green, totally underrated, and if you're lucky, you might spot some of the rarest undulates, the Dama Gazelle. Not to be confused with the Drama Gazelle, which is my cousin Bert. He got a lot of issues, man. It is said that you can find over 370 species of bird here, including the national bird, the cream-coloured corsair. Otherwise, head south to the Sahara and you'll find the largest national park, Jabil. You've got fennec foxes, jackals, hyenas, cobras and horn vipers and barbary sheep which are all endemic and if you're lucky, you might spot the super rare addicts. Finally, also known in the southern area, are horses. The local Berber community has quite an equestrian based culture that involves ferrisia events and shows. And speaking of horses, it's time for you to meet up. Giddy up on out of here! Cheerio, mates! Thank you, Gary. And to add to the animals, Tunisians love seafood. They definitely like the fish off those coasts. You know what's coming up. We're going to discuss the food of Tunisia. And with that, let's go back to Sami and Ahmed. First off, we love carbs. <laughs> It is said that we are the second largest consumer per capita on pasta after Italy. Some will claim Tunisia is probably has the spiciest cuisine in the Arab world, which is true. And this is the proof. It's the best harissa in the world. In any case, some of our top dishes might include things like brik, which is a pastry with egg and tuna. Frikassé, which is savory donut. Mlewi, of course. Oh, the best. My favorite, my personal favorite. And there's also Lassidus Gugu, which is I love it. Ahmed's favorite. And finally, the trifecta of Tunisian cuisine, specifically for weddings and special occasions, the tagine couscous, the sladam shuya. Yeah, Tunisian tagine is basically quiche. And our version of couscous usually contains seafood, like sea bream or squid. So that's it for our food. You guys should try it. Woohoo! Thank you. Also, a little side note, Tunisia has a noticeable wine growing region and they do brew beer. It's actually an old tradition that dates back to the Carthaginian times. Well, that's all I got for you. Until next time, stay tuned and stay ready. Thank you, Noah. By the way, Sammy, what's your favorite Tunisian dish? Fricassé, kafteji, leblebi. That's pretty interesting. You guys can your harissa? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the best in the world. Try it. I think it's actually expired. Well, so far you've probably picked up the variables that make up Tunisia as a state and as a landmass. Only one ingredient left to this recipe, the people. Tunisians. So, Sami Ahmed, what is a Tunisian person? Ooh, that's a tough one. A Tunisian has a deep knowledge of, like, about the Arabs and Africans, Europeans, and even Americans, but 
none of them understand his culture uh we're kind of arabs but not quite because we are so diverse and mixed and we keep our traditions from a long time ago so we could be aliens as far as i know <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> we're out of this world so uh tunisians are just kind of tunisians it's like that's the best way to describe you guys we're just people <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> well if we must break the nation down demographically here's how we do it tunisia has a population of about 12 million people and was recognized as one of the freest and open countries in the arab world the country claims to be about 98% Arab or sometimes Arab Berber depending on who you talk to genealogy records and DNA tests have revealed that it is speculated that within the group of Arabs about 60% are said to have some degree of native North African Berber or Amazigh ancestry within their heritage the Arab title though is complicated because it doesn't pertain to any specific ethnic group but rather just people that speak Arabic and have an Arab identity whatever that may be from there about 1% claim to actually be Berber or Amazigh and the remaining 1% are other groups mostly Europe European. So we use the Tunisian dinar as our currency and we use the type C and E plug outlets and we drive on the right side of the road. So let's talk about language. Most Tunisians are at least bilingual with the official language Arabic as well as French which is used from schools from elementary and up. Yeah, we study French from second grade and English from third grade. In high school all subjects are on, in French. So in high school everything is in French? Yes. Do you speak Ar any Arabic in high school? Just the one Arabic subject. Just Arabic subject and is few others like the religion oh like something. religion yeah. Philosophy. Yeah. Philosophy. philosophy nonetheless with arabic tunisians actually have their own distinct tunisian dialect it's often described as like sing-songy difficult to understand the dialect is actually paid close to the maltese language to explain more uh ahmed come on in why don't you explain about the language and uh we'll add another geography people with him okay guys let, so let's talk about our dialect so tunisians sometimes use very old school arabic words and we also mix up french spanish italian and amazon for example, Barsha is an OG Arabic word and it basically just means a lot. So our word sounds sexier and I like that. <laughs> in Amazigh, we say fakroon, which means turtle. In Spanish, we say sabat, which means a shoe. Like sapato. Italian, we use carita, meaning a horse wagon. Oftentimes, we take French words but conjugate them in our own way. For example, like for example, the word exam, we usually use the French word, which is examen, but with a slight twist for the plural word. We take the plural et suffix from the Arabic and stick it on the French word examen, and it becomes examinet. To say, I need to study because I have to take many exams this semester, in Tunisian we'd say, As you can see, we use the French letters to write it and with number. To substitute the letters that have no equivalent in French. 9 for Qa, 3 for A, just because they look like the Arabic letters. I also used word very known to be Tunisian, like Khatr, because Barsha, so many. Thank you. One thing that kind of makes Tunisia stick out is that although nominally we are primarily Arab, we are also kind of like the mixed descendants of all empires. Which means they don't have a sense of typical Arab tribalism. The social sector has kind of allowed us to walk the fine line between what is deemed acceptable in Arab conservatism versus westernized values. It's an identity crisis. Basically. Tunisia is often designated by outside sources as the freest country in the Arab world and most open to civil equality. Oftentimes, they're also kind of considered the most open to Western values in the Arab world as well. But a lot of you guys were thinking of me. Keep in mind, the key word was Western values. A lot of people seem to conflate that term with modern development, which is not necessary or mutually exclusive to that term. Just keep that in mind. This is why Tunisia has been a pioneer for many other moments in the Arab world. Having the oldest constitution in the Arab world, we were the first to abolish slavery. They were also the first nation in the Arab world that allowed women to file for divorce and receive inheritance, pass on nationality to children, as well as even marrying outside of the Muslim faith. Legally, women are allowed to wear almost anything from hijabs to bikinis. However, recently after extremist attacks, they put a ban on full face and body veils. Today, women also make up about 30% of their parliament. So yeah, there's a lot of female stuff happening in Tunisia. We're proud of it. We like it. Female stuff. Yay. Although some of these rights were around long ago, many of them were spurred by the 2010 Tunisian or Jasmine Revolution, which ousted former president Ben Ali. This was the trigger moment that sparked the Arab Spring. You've probably heard of it. It basically went down like this. Mm. Ah, revolution! Revolution! Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. 
Unfortunately, Tunisia was also kind of the only country to have had relative success after their revolution. Every other country that took part in the Arab Spring, except for Bahrain, pretty much fell into civil war. Now, it hasn't been clear and smooth sailing for Tunisia either. Our economy took a hit and we've had like five presidents in 10 years. So uh, they're kind of like still in the experiment stage, figuring things out, but overall, they mostly achieved the legislative objectives that they wanted. Yeah, we could go on on this topic, but we have to move on. Religion! Within the constitution, Islam is the state religion and about 98% of the country identifies as Muslim, about 60% of that group claiming to be Sunni. The constitution does allow freedom of religion and respects cultures that have played a role in their history and cultural identity. You can find some churches mostly in Tunis and there are about 2,000 Jews still living in Tunisia, about two thirds of which can be found on Jerba Island, which has Africa's oldest synagogue. And a lot of Jews take a pilgrimage over there, right? Yes. Like every year, it's like a thing they do. Well, one other thing Tunisians make pilgrimages to are stadiums whenever a sporting event occurs. To talk about that, here's Art with the sports part. Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. I guess it's time for the sports part with art. It's like the beginning of a cult video. Like. So when it comes to athletics, it pretty much goes without saying, Tunisians are the best swimmers in the Arab world. Thanks to their maritime culture and access to swimming facilities, Tunisians know how to get around the old splish splash, splishity splu, whatever you want to call it. Today, they've racked up three gold medals and one bronze in swimming events at the Olympics, more than any other Arab nation. This guy, Usama Malouli, won two gold medals and has competed in every Olympics from Beijing to Tokyo. He's a big deal. And what goes better with water than a beach? And what can you find at a beach? Volleyball! Tunisia is today ranked number one in Africa with 11 African championships in men's volleyball. Also, this Tunisian woman right here is the number one ranked African and Arab female tennis player. She won her biggest title to date in the 2022 Madrid Open, a WTA 1000 event. This made her the first Tunisian and Arab player in the world to win at that level. Finally, you cannot talk sports in Tunisia without bringing up soccer or football. Everyone in Tunisia pretty much supports one of these four teams right here. Their national team, the Eagles of Carnage. <laughs> carnage? <laughs> I say Carnage. They're just tearing up the place. Their national team, the Eagles of Carthage, has won the Africa Cup, the African Nations Championship, and the Arab Cup. They've qualified for FIFA six times, with their highest rank being ninth back in 1978 in Argentina. So that's uh, pretty much it, and I gotta go. So Thank you, Thank Art. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Like the theme of water keeps kind of popping up in Tunisia and like every, like we just learned swimming is a huge part of your culture. Yes, like, like it's big. Oh, Ahmed, what is this thing you are wearing? That's a Tunisian thing. What is it? Explain, Sami. It's a shashia. It's our traditional hat. Oh, it looks good on you. Yeah, you'll find this in Tunisia every so often. It's mostly for special occasions. Well, to explain a little bit more on the culture and stuff like that, here is Random Hannah. I love this. <laughs> 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 Hi guys, I am back, your favorite host on Geography Now. So, Tunisia has a lot going on. First thing you need to know, the jasmine flower. It's the national flower and used in like so many ways. Often, a mesh moon or small bouquet of jasmine flowers will be worn by a man to symbolize that he is single and ready to mingle. At special events, people might wear the traditional clothing. Tunisians are all about fashion. Jalabas and dengris are popular unisex garments, but for women, there are way more options because every major region has their own traditional dress. Architecture is very distinct. Many homes and buildings will have the traditional bob door, which usually has a rounded arch top, vivid colors, and adorned with symmetrical metal bolt patterns or arabesque carvings. You will also notice many of the shutters are painted blue. This is done for both beauty and to ward off evil spirits. In fact, the visual arts have always been Tunisia's strong point. They are world renowned for their carpets, handicrafts, and pottery. In fact, in the town of Sheznan, there is a rare 3,000 year old terracotta sculpting technique of pottery still practiced by the women in the village. And speaking of art, film, that's my specialty. And Tunisia has a lot going on. Tunisians love cinema so much, they even have their annual Carthage Film Festival. This is the oldest of its kind in Africa, started in 1966. It's designed to promote and uplift African film, as well as Arab film. Many Tunisian movies were nominated for Oscars and took part in the Cannes Film Festival. I actually just went there and I'm gonna make a little video on it, so subscribe to my YouTube channel. <laughs> During Ramadan every year, the people watch these TV shows. These are their classics. 
Movies like these have made waves across the Arab world. The Silences of the Palace was a highly acclaimed film set in the 1950s. It addressed issues that women faced during the time. And Dasra, Tunisia's first horror movie. So many good movies stuff. Speaking of festivals, the largest one that takes place in the country is the world-renowned International Festival of Carthage. It takes place in the actual Roman amphitheater. This is basically Tunisia's Super Bowl. And that's just one festival. They have so many others. And of course, you can't have a festival without music, which ugh, keep. Ah, yeah, guys, sorry, Keith is busy with his job in Florida. Uh, we need to have a substitute. Uh, who else here knows music? Oh, Gabs! Keith, we miss you, and we're gonna do this episode without you and your beautiful long hair. Woohoo! Tunisia! Let's talk about the tunes of Nisia. <laughs> So like we explained already, Tunisian music is reflective of all the cultural influences they've been through. Andalusian, Turkish, Persian, Greek, French, and of course, Arab. Today they have even a national artistic institution that specializes in teaching and preserving Tunisian music. Go there! And if you ask any Tunisian person what is distinctively Tunisian music, well for one, Tunisians tend to add the violin a lot more to their music and typically they will mix it with their traditional instruments and song. As for genres, most of them will probably focus on two things. Malouf, which is the traditional classic music which is usually played at weddings, this has a South Spanish influence to it. Many Muslims from Spain migrated to North Africa in the 15th century and brought it with them. This style usually mixes fast string plucking on the oud guitar with violins, drums, and slow passionate vocals. What's the fastest you can pluck, Gabs? I can do this thing that's like kind of Spanish-y where it's like... No, I can't. No, okay. <laughs> Keith, I can't take your place, man. The second style would probably be being Mizwad. The style is named after the instrument, the Mizwad or Tunisian bagpipe. Yes, they have bagpipes here. It has a single reed and is made of goat leather. Mizwad music is faster, more upbeat, and is usually accompanied by the traditional Darbuka drum. Mizwad even has its own style of dance and is said to make people enter into a trance-like state when they're listening to it. Who doesn't love falling into trances? Do you like falling in trances? I sure as hell do not. What are we implying here? <laughs> Mizwad is such a popular style of music that it even made its way into contemporary Tunisian pop and rap music. Otherwise, here are some of the top musicians and music artists you guys, the Tunisian Geogra peeps, also suggested we mention in the video. So much to say about them, but we don't have time. If you are Tunisian and want to add to this list or tell us something cool about the artist, let us know. Write it in the comments. Or not. Hate us. Love us. <laughs> We're still be here. And finally, metal has creeped its way into Tunisia and has seen a steadily growing community. Gotta say, Keith, I checked out this band. Definitely don't know how to pronounce it. They have a really cool folk metal style that mixes traditional Tunisian instruments with violins and, of course, metal guitars. Pretty awesome. Uh-oh. I gotta go. See you guys. Play the drum, do you? Every Tunisian knows this. Some are <laughs> Yeah. Well, we covered a lot. So much of Tunisia is built off of history and outside influences. But how do outsiders today see Tunisia and influence them? Let's find out. Next segment. Let's go. So, okay, as a super diplomatic country, obviously, Tunisia has a lot of relations that either go way back or are recent. Let's just jump into the motion graphic, shall we? So first of all, as a member of numerous IGOs like the Arab League, African Union, and the Arab Maghreb Union, Tunisia is pretty much the mediator between much of the Arab world and even the African continent. There was even a time when Cote d'Ivoire was having domestic issues and was unable to host the African Development Bank. So who took over the reins for 11 years? Tunisia. Outside of Africa, though, Tunisia is one of the U.S.'s oldest African diplomatic partners with relations dating back over 200 years. The American Friendship Treaty was signed in 1799. Things like trade, tourism, and joint military exercises have been a part of the relationship since then. On that note, France, of course, has a special relationship with them as well due to their history and shared linguistic skills. Also, France hosts the largest Tunisian community in diaspora at over 1 million. Numerous business and government connections have been established after independence. France is their largest export and import partner, and many French companies have also relocated to Tunisia, which helps them with a little bit of an economic boost. 
Italy and Malta are pretty close too. They are just a skip away, and historically many South Italians and Tunisians have migrated to each other's lands and intermarried, and the Maltese language being derived from Tunisian Arabic is just one hint that shows how close they have been throughout the centuries. Now if you want to talk about inner circle, you have to go back to North Africa. On a political level, they've had their ups and downs with Egypt since the 50s when they criticized the Arab Union thing that Egypt tried to incite. Things got really good after the Arab Spring, but then the coup d'etat in Egypt strained things again. But then Tunisia's Nida Tunis movement improved things all over again, so up and down, up and down. Now, Tunisians love Libya, however, Libya is kind of like the country that they'd like to make memes about and poke fun at for a little bit. Like Egypt, they've had their up and down moments, whether it was Gaddafi-related, oil-related, or just Libya trying to take over the town of Gafsa in 1980. But overall, Tunisia decided to lift sanctions and normalize trade to bolster relations. When it comes to their best friends, though, almost every Tunisian I have talked to has said Algeria. Both of them have shared every moment of their history together, dating back to the Punic Phoenician era, and today they go hand in hand. They signed the Treaty of Fraternity and Concord in 1983, they do lots of trade and business, they intermarry a lot, and overall these two have been mostly backing each other up non-stop since day one. It's just a little complicated because Tunisia is also friends with Morocco, but Algeria and Morocco on paper have that little dispute over the Sahrawi people's claim in Western Sahara. However, aside from all that, Moroccans and Tunisians as people get along pretty well and enjoy each other's company. It's just, you know, don't, don't talk about the Polisario thing. All right, so in conclusion, you guys are the Tunisians. Ahmed, take my mic and speak from the heart. Go. How would you conclude this episode? Go. I'm looking for that word. In conclusion, we're a small country, but we have a lot to offer. True. <laughs> <laughs> Even those little things, the dumb shit we do, I, I, I like it. Do you know what I like the most about Tunisia? It's those little contradictions. Muslims, but liberal. We're, we're Arabs, but Europeanized. We have great food. We have great beaches. I don't know. It's just a great country. Look it up. Woo, Tunisia! Yes, Tunisia! Uh, let's Thank you guys. Turkey is coming up next. And don't confuse our flags. Yeah, don't. <laughs>